Hi, just wanted to cut in to let you know that if you want to support this show or some others that are like it, you can go to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. That is patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. Thanks. Some of our landings were desperate adventures. We are now prepared to meet the inevitable counterattacks with power and with confidence. My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Bonfire Side Chat. It is a dreaming favorite. Yes, and this week we are, I like that one, dreaming favorite. Yeah. Pretty it's, good. It's, it's, it sounds like a like a 70s X-Men villain, <laughs> like like a, like a member of, uh, you know, the Terror Triad or something like that, and they're like hang out with Bernard the Poet and storm the disco where Dazzler lives. <laughs> yes, and this week well, we were talking about X-Men and also your responses to uh, old Yarnum. Uh, we, uh, Matt, Matt Lees, uh, we sent him away because of time zone differences and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. uh, we really appreciate him joining us last week. You can find him, uh, just do a Google for Matt Lees, and he is pretty much everywhere. He does, he does pop up everywhere, and he has a diverse uh, body of work. Yeah. So I, I said it before, but I first came to him uh, with his critique of Bioshock Infinite. I'm always up for people talking trash about Bioshock Infinite because it's <laughs> my least favorite Bioshock game. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, well-reasoned uh, discussions of why that game doesn't work is mm-hmm. one of my favorite things online. Yeah. Um, and Matt does does a great one. Yeah. Um, yeah, but enough of that. This mm-hmm. isn't the Bioshock Infinite podcast check out our discussion on yeah, the level yeah, just gonna say yeah. <laughs> we've done that already um so yeah so we're gonna we're gonna talk about i'm gonna get started here with a little follow-up mm-hmm. uh, michael says via contact hey guys quick note love the podcast but i have to say i was really disappointed with all the come talk at the end of the last episode not because i had a problem with it but because you missed the perfect opportunity to reference sticky white stuff um <laughs> yes we did what a what a day and night <laughs> That that episode and this one we just recorded. I know, right? <laughs> was at least I mean day day and white, black and white <laughs> stuff. Like it's just literally just uh how much come talk to how little come talk. Like you will be you will be listener, if you haven't listened to it yet, you will be surprised how little we bring up semen <laughs> with with Matt Lee's with with a very renowned YouTuber and game journalist. Matt Lee's, Lee's and how comfortable we are bringing it up with CJ and Patty. Yep. Oh, you know, um, this, this does kind of become a different show from guest to guest, right? You know, we, yeah. tr- we try and match tone and we want to make it a comfortable place. And it just, uh, <laughs> and it, it just turned out that it was a very comfortable place. What, what, what <laughs> you say? Well, if you read between the lines, what Cole is saying is we're looking for a good queef guest. So if you can, <laughs> if you can think, no, I'm just kidding. Dear I don't God, even like no. saying that word. No, <laughs> like, it's pretty bad. The, um, but it, it does, it is a new bodily fluid for everyone. And this one <laughs> happened to be blood. With at least we talked about blood. Oh, yeah. Um, but, uh, come <laughs> so, five short grables. We're going to talk about five different bodily fluids. Can yeah. you guess which ones? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, yep. we had a straight, it was like a network wide, like hashtag drenched fest. Yeah. <laughs> hashtag drenched. <laughs> Shudder. <laughs> well, I saw, I saw you use that when, uh, when, uh, what, what's his name? Sam brought up the flop house, which again, yeah. like talked about come a lot. Like, I don't know if there was just like something and like, uh, did somebody lace all the microphones in the world? <laughs> There's something in the moon, <laughs> like something in the pole of the moon. It's, it's finally menstruation. It's finally, uh, dudes being affected by the moon, except instead of menstruating, we just talk about come a lot because <laughs> of our privilege. Like more, that is the thing that we get to do more openly. Yes. Yeah. You know, the, the, As opposed to just thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, then the usual hush tones with which we address our vile <laughs> seed. <laughs> hey, buddy. Can you man, are you menstruating right now? <laughs> oh, no. Am I showing? Have I got a stain? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's that that is just gross. So yes, we did miss that opportunity. We've talked about how gross the sticky white stuff is in the past, um, especially in regards to the uh, the three D dot game heroes interpretation of oh, it. Yeah. Where's uh, some, where there is definitely something about Mary. Um yeah. but, but um we continue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jordan writes in via the contact forum saying, I was listening to the last episode and I noticed that all of you agreed that if you give her the brooch, her storyline ends, referring to the little girl in Yardum. I gave it to her on my second playthrough and after a couple of boss kills, I came back to the window and found no answer. Um, I then moved down to the sewer bore and found her ribbon. So either way, her story continues because after more bosses, her sister will appear in the window and you can continue calling the wambulance by handing her the red ribbon. Mm. Yeah, so I guess uh, 
Huh. I, we, I, we didn't, I mean, we, I thought we were explicit. We didn't talk about the sister, but I thought we referenced that the sister comes later. We referenced that something happens later. Yeah. We're, we're still trying to figure out. So we're threading a needle about what approach to take with NPCs. Yeah. Where like we can just explore them fully or we have to wait. Um, originally, like with uh, Gilbert, like my thought was to explore them fully, but then mm-hmm. a couple people didn't like that. Yeah. So we're kind of going back and forth. So chalk this up to that. Yeah. Or they like I was aware of the older sister, mm-hmm. but we're just being careful as to what we talk about and when. Yeah. Um, and specifically, I didn't want to talk about the older sister because um, the uh, the lore hunter on our Facebook page was talking about his theory about the older sister, which ties into another NPC that we're definitely not ready to talk about yet. Yeah. Um, so that is what is at work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is just uh, we will cover it all. Yeah. At some point. So if it says, if there's something that's a suspicious omission like that, please write in. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, so don't, you know, do do what you normally do. Mm-hmm. But there's a chance we are going to cover it anyway. Yeah. And I think that what uh, what Jordan was responding to is just the idea that we said that if you give her the the, the ribbon, the quest ends. Um, but it seems like regardless, she leaves the house and gets killed by the boar, no matter if you send her to uh, either of the places anyway. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think that that's what Jordan is writing in about. But definitely, like, uh, uh, I mean, right in. But uh, we possibly have taken these things into, into consideration. And since so many of these kind of like coincide with the differences in the moon changes, um, yeah. that, that might be the time when, like, you know, after certain events in the game, we're going to kind of go back and do some revisits on things that have changed significantly like this one. Well, we're going to do that. And then we're also going to do ones that are location dependent. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so on to actual responses. Alex says via contact. The initial run through Old Yarnum was amazing, and Dura opening up on you with the Atlan gun was, for me, the exact moment that I realized we were a long way from Lordran. It's one of the best holy shit moments in the game. Yeah, I included this one just because, like, I wasn't sure if we were going to cover it, but that that, that Gatlin gun moment is such a departure from the rest of the series. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the, the kind of the way that, um, something that, like, I haven't seen anyone else really like, but one of the things I really like about, um, in Dark Souls 2 with Black Gulch, huh? um, the way that I can, I think you're supposed to go through that, which is to run through it like a football drill. <laughs> um, and every once in a while, it's very rare that I'll get to a level in a Souls game where it's like, oh, they haven't done this before. Uh-huh. Um, and this was that for me. Yeah. Like, uh, because yeah. a lot of, you know, even really, really well designed areas, like, what can you say about, central yarnum mm-hmm. you know like it is it has a, it's really interesting lore wise and and there are interesting assets on it and everything yeah. but from a design standpoint they've done kind of like yeah. platforms and stairs and, and that kind of thing like there's the gimmick to it is just the number of guys but they've mm-hmm. even done that yeah to a degree you know like it, it's everywhere it's rare when something totally new comes up yeah and this is one of those things the, the, this extra motivation to move quickly in a, in, a, in a less considered way than you otherwise would yeah yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned football with uh, with with the uh, uh, black gulch because I, I you know later on like maybe about six months later uh, I was going <laughs> to invoke football for a boss that I know that you really don't like. Hmm. So I'm look, looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, football. The, the, yeah. Catch the fever. Um, hmm. Let's hear Jeremy Greer, our friend, um, who criticizes Gary's cat uh, via Facebook. He does it mostly on Twitter. But. Okay. <laughs> well, he writes in via Facebook. It's confusing. Yeah. I know. Um, he writes in saying, I'm sure most people will be talking about Machine Gun Man. <clears throat> uh, but to me, the most striking part. He just put a comma, a comma there that made him sound like a cool hit, like, <laughs> beat poet. I'm sure most people will be talking about Machine Gun Man. Like, you just said that, like, like 70s Paul Simon for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> 51 ways to shoot your lover? Yeah. <laughs> I guess not 51. That's the Ockerville yeah. River song. Fuck. Um, just put it in her head, Fred. <laughs> just shoot her in the back, Jack. Just stick it in the knee, Lee. And set yourself free. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway. That's pretty dark. I don't, I don't, obviously violence against women is no, no joke. Or anything right. Like that. But it's, but, uh, in, in Your the context... could be a man too. It could totally be, you know, like shoot him in an alley, Sally. Yeah. Like <laughs> any, any of those things would be fine. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I had to clear my throat after that, but I will take it again. Um, I'm sure most people will be talking about the machine gun man, but to me, the most striking part of the level is right after you enter the side of a chapel and hear some strange noises. A few familiar enemies are around and after killing them, you proceed only to find another enemy on a balcony by itself. When it sees you and it screams, all of a sudden, uh, the strange noises, they stop. 
that's when you look around and realize that a large group of beasties were who were apparently worshiping a string a strung up corpse which just happens to look like the boss of the area how very weird and unsettling this is uh and man that i spend a lot of time looking around with a monocular to see what's around I will say that killing the blood star, the blood star beast, um, uh, and realizing this whole area was optional was a huge letdown. Granted, it connects to a different area and goes so far as to allow you to meet a new NPC if you do it that way. But uh, this was one of the first times that I went really after killing the boss. It's amazing and kind of disappointing uh, that it wasn't uh, the last by a long shot either. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. When he's talking about um, it connecting to a different area, he's not referring to the Chalice Dungeons. Right. He's referring to the the alternate way yeah. um, that you can get in. Um, and it does connect, but it's a one-way connection. Mm-hmm. So you can't actually leave that. Um, yeah, it's a it's a bummer to me too, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm with you. The, uh, the sheer number of weird optional bosses and stuff, like, the, and it plays into a larger, like, offness of the reward structure mm-hmm. in Bloodborne for me, where, like, the soul levels feel lower, the amount of items you can find and stuff. Like some of the reward feeling is is gone for me in the gameplay aspect of the rewards. Not the mm-hmm. like lore rewards or the satisfaction rewards, which are still yeah. really potent, but the stuff and numbers rewards. Yeah. But like I, it's a less of an emphasis. I do like the way that it obfuscates the critical path. Like it was a little bit bewildering in the moment, but in the in the the, the part of me that appreciates terrible survival horror definitely like revels in that um, somewhat during, but mostly after the fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, Sean Wagner says via Facebook, and we can split this one up if you would like. Um, I, I can do it. The next one's long too. Okay. Or the next the next ones, and this is the uh, the lore hunter as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Sean says. <clears throat> Essential Yarnum characterizes a failing Yarnum. Old Yarnum represents a fallen Yarnum. I love the introduction to Old Yarnum. This town is long abandoned. Hunters not wanted here. Posted on the door. <laughs> no is dogs as much a- allowed. <laughs> yeah, no homers. Um, no hunters. You guys already have a hunter in there. <laughs> well, it's, it said no hunters. Um, <laughs> Continue. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, with the author of the note very firmly telling you to turn back as you take your first steps into the town. <clears throat> Blunt message that you're not wanted here, coupled with a hellscape of smoldering corpses, burning beast, and a ruined city, make this area drip with a foreboding atmosphere. As Jeremy said, this place is not part of the critical path, but that is kind of okay with me, because although it is a letdown coming to a dead end, I never once considered skipping the area on any of my playthroughs. The atmosphere and dangers of this area got my head turning in my initial playthrough, but subsequent playthroughs gave me the confidence to really explore the area and dig into the story, which is just as, if not more evocative to me, than the atmosphere. I think Old Yarnum is a medical experiment gone terribly wrong. The description of the white church doctor garb says, uh, These doctors are superiors to the black preventative hunters and Mm -hmm. specialists in experimentally uh, backed blood menstruation and the scourge of the beast. They believe that medicine is not a mess, uh, a means of treatment, but rather a method of research, and that some knowledge can only be obtained by exposing oneself to sickness. I think that the white church doctors poison the residents of Old Yarnum. They cause the ashen blood, the baffling sickness that ravaged Old Yarnum, as the antidote item description states. They want to experiment with the old blood, and a widespread sickness would give them ample patience to seek healing. Uh, even if the church people knew uh, that people would turn into beasts as a result, they were not prepared for the extent of which this would happen. The Red Moon, or Pale Blood Moon, appeared, and the residents of Yarnum became beast, and the church and their desperation raised the town. Whether the church worried that the scourge could not be contained, or worried that the citizens of, citizens of Yarnum would realize that the good blood was not good at all, or both, they sealed themselves off from the rest of Yarnum. This event marks for me the beginning of Yarnum's ruin, and is a tale of dark experiments gone wrong and innocent people caught in the crossfire that seems to characterize some of the most impactful parts of Bloodborne's narrative for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we obliquely talked about it, uh, you know, beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what, that is a leading theory, and I, I don't feel too bad about spoiling it or saying it, because it's, you know, it's well thought of and also you know, yeah. not, uh, not the only thing the pieces, like, I mean, like, like the, like the pieces are there, right? Like the idea that this yeah. is something of a ground zero, the fact that it has been blocked off and the fact that it's directly, att- directly attributed to the church, um, you yeah. know, c- c- kind of definitely gives you the pieces to understand that the church is somewhat responsible here. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the whys and, and what fors are still kind of up in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, as John mentions, like whether they burned it down because of the, the exposure or because of like, they're trying to cover something up. Mm-hmm. Um, both of those are, and then it you're, it adds actual 
um, kind of depth to it when you add in the idea of this uh, chalice being here as well. Mm -hmm. um, because this whole thing, you know, in addition to experimentation, could have been done to create a wall around this chalice. Yeah. Too. The fact that arguably, even though from a gameplay perspective, getting to the chalice dungeons isn't that that great, from a the storyline perspective, access to the chalice is, like I said, it's Pandora's box. Like, it mm -hmm. is a, it is huge, you know? So there can be a lot of narrative weight ascribed to the idea of guarding that or preventing people from getting to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that could have been a reason why they burned down the town as well. Um, and then, you know, as, as we mentioned before, um, you know, they employed the, the powder keg hunters, and one of which who has second thoughts. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, a, in general, as, as usual, good, good work, Sean. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything to add to that. I subscribe to those theories as well. Um, let's see mm -hmm. here. So Greg writes in via contact saying, the experience I had in the first half of Old Yarnum felt like it came from something completely other than a Souls game. Constantly having to worry about DJ Yura's <laughs> uh, DJ Yura's uh, Hail of Death from Above made me feel like I had somehow wandered into a third-person shooter game. When I finally made it into the lower section of the area, I breathed a huge sigh of relief. Sure, now I was surrounded with even larger, more wolfish enemies, but at least I didn't have to worry about being chain-staggered to death if I stepped out of cover for a moment. I'm not a huge fan of the Bloodstar Beast. I had uh, gotten through the majority of the game, uh, but the beast still takes the cake for the boss that has given me the most trouble. It feels like all the elements are there for an awesome fight, but each of them are slightly off, leading to a frustrating experience. The spastic leaping of the beast should make things feel frantic, but instead it just ends up being frustrating as your camera whips around uh, at breakneck speeds. The poison element uh, should make the fight feel tense and dangerous, but the rate that the poison builds up means that you just have to accept that you'll be poisoned for most of the fight. The beast having what is effectively one hit kill in its grab attack just seems mean. Since, the f uh, since to fight the damn thing, I had to unlock my camera, meaning I didn't always have a clear look for all of its tells. I ended up beating the boss by brute force, sticking to it like glue, slashing it to ribbons as fast as I could, which felt contradictory to the spirit of the, uh, to the spirit of a fight with a monster hemorrhaging poison. Sure, I felt good when I finally beat the beast, uh, but the experience left a sour taste in my mouth. Still, I did enjoy the area as a whole for the new elements it brought to the table. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to that yeah. either. Um, like I've, I've on the record of being like, I don't love the boss fights in Bloodborne as fights. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them I don't love as a fight either. Like, yeah. I, it's OK. Like, I don't think it's the worst one or anything um, in the game, but it, I don't love it. Like, I wasn't like, this is great. I can't wait to fight this guy. This is going to be a fun fight. I never think that about this guy. I'm kind of um, curious about the uh, the uh, the uh, etymology that's in play here. The fact that it's blood starved. Right. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, like um, I, I meant to bring that up in the in the actual main episode, but the idea, like the the, the werewolves don't the werewolves they do not feed on blood. Yeah, or I mean they might, but no more than like that than you do by, by by you know by jamming it into your arm at every second, you know, at, at every inconvenience, right? <laughs> yeah, or or like even more than I do is like eating meat, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. or something like that. Like it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I don't know why he's blood starved either. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I, I don't really get that other than the fact that maybe it was an evocative name. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's my that's my guess. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, he's I, I agree with you. He's not my favorite either as a fight for many of the re same reasons that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and also, but part of that is like like Matt alluded to, um, since this is optional, you don't have to go. This doesn't have to be the third boss you fight. Um, but at the time, without doing proper exploration, it was a choice between this and Amelia and Amelia, I had a much harder time with, yeah. um, which I'll talk about at length during next episode. Where <laughs> at the the level I got to, where I literally could not kill her yeah. um, without. And then I, I, I mean, there's a trick to it, but I didn't realize the trick. So dumb, dumb me, I guess. But it was very. It doesn't change the fact that I was really frustrated. Yeah. Um, I couldn't beat her without the trick. Right. Um, Robert says via contact. Passing through Old Yarnum with my newest character yesterday, a Bruce Campbell lookalike with a saw cleaver and a blunderbuss, I noticed that the shrouded beast looked very similar to the sack-carrying dudes that will eventually kidnap you. I think the sack-carrying dudes, I'm pretty sure that's their official name, <laughs> are the next step in evolution of the shrouded beast. Anyway, my first time through the game, I totally missed the subtly longer arms of the regular enemies in Central Yarnum, and so the shrouded beast were my first indication that humans will eventually turn into beasts. This, of course, means that I also missed Mr. Window Guy, Gilbert, uh, which might have given me a clue beforehand. By the way, do you think the beast in the large hall, the one you can set on fire, is a partner to the Bloodstar Beast? I think it looks similar, at least. 
it would be uh, it would be interesting to know if the Beast and Bloodborne uh, can still form relationships amongst each other. Hmm. Also, fuck Jira, or as I call him, Gatlin dude. Uh, he is a nice guy if you finally talk to him, but I think I'll stick <laughs> I'll stick to kicking him off the ledge on my next playthrough um, as revenge for the countless times he's killed me on my first playthrough. I means well. <laughs> yeah, he he means well. He's he's just uh, you know. If if you can yell to me, why can't I yell to you? Like, <laughs> no, wait. Like, <laughs> I don't want to kill these guys. This way? It's a video game. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't kill the, this uh, time. I like I didn't I didn't beat him this time because I uh, wanted hmm. to uh, approach him from, from the other side, but I also needed to play the rest of this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still haven't done that. I just watched it on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I wasn't that hungry for the the gesture, even though I think it's one of the cooler ones. I think it's the like yeah, the, shakes cave. Yeah, shake shake off dust. Off. You do the uh, like it's the yeah. it's the it's the pimp it's the uh, the the pimp sweep. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty shoulders. sweet. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I uh. I. I'm sad that we missed the opportunity to uh, to call this Gatlinburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. I don't think the uh, patients turn into the the sack men. Yeah, the sack men um, feel like the, something different, right? Yeah, the Sackmen work for somebody else, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, and, and in a different geographical area. I think those guys are pretty tied to Yargol and work for uh, a character we're going to meet yeah. later mm-hmm. who is aligned with this uh, this Mensis mm-hmm. um, movement or, or cult or whatever sect, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. So I don't think they are the same. They do kind of look the same. Yeah. Um, but everybody's kind of got a weird, like, you know, eyes occluded and hoods over their face are kind of a, a running running thing in this game so yeah. um it's an interesting idea but i, I don't think so mm-hmm. um but yeah, other than that it is it is interesting the idea of like why there are two blood star beasts why one is um <laughs> you know crucified um i'm guessing like i mean it's not literally the same person right um so it could be a partner yeah. it could also be just somebody who you know if they were crucified there before the infection took place um just this is this is an end thing this is something that you can evolve into if you have the right mixture of a regular blood or ashen blood or yeah. they something was introduced into their ashen blood that turned them into this yeah they, i mean they're in the same location so they might have been subject to the same conditions yeah yeah oh. i don't i'd love to hear any theories like if anybody is spotting some kind of connection to something else that we're not seeing um then yeah, definitely tell, write yeah, in tell, absolutely like i want to know why there is a crucified bloodstar beast and who that person is yeah. i also want to know who bloodstar beast is if he's a you know, a capital N NPC. Mm-hmm. Um, people have talked about it. I feel like in, in uh, theoretical terms that are theoretical to the degree that I don't pay them very much mind. Mm-hmm. I would like to hear people's, you know, well thought out good theories about that. Yeah. If you have them, because you know me, I want all my bosses to actually be somebody <laughs> if possible. Um, and this one, I haven't found anything compelling yet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stuart writes in via contact saying, I really think it should be emphasized how much of an event trigger uh, it is to beat the Bloodstar Beast. I didn't actually come here until much later, and it sucked to know that I missed out on so much. Also, my partner thinks that I should mention how much the blood's, uh, how much the beast looks like an angry vagina. I guess it keeps uh, with the theme of birth? So uh, the the first point, um, I, don't, <laughs> I, I guess I don't have like a catalog of all the things this triggers, mm-hmm. um, at least mentally. Um, it I, does trigger, I know it opens up the, that door mm-hmm. in the cathedral ward, but like I, you know, historically, um, you know, always knew there's another way around that and didn't pay that much attention to it, even though I guess like this is the, the canon way. Mm-hmm. Um, what else does it do? Do you have like kind of a running idea? <sighs> no, I did a search for it and, uh, we, we started recording a peek behind the curtain during my work day. So I wasn't able to like, look at this as I was putting the notes together. Um, so yeah. I don't know. I think yeah, it, I, I think it, it advances closes. some kind of uh, some NPC quests, or at least moves moves them to a different place. That makes sense. This might be. I wonder if this is the thing that introduces the the kind of decoy NPC. Hmm. But I thought that happened later. I thought that happened after Amelia. So it gets hmm. kind of confusing since they're in relatively uh, close quarters. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the game doesn't uh, give you, you know a heads up that things are going to be different yeah. that way. So it does lead to this kind of like checking in on every NPC after every event, yeah. which can get kind of tedious. And there's no real sign um, posting about when the, when the sun and moon are going to advance as well. And that is a huge ratchet yeah. on, uh, on the available uh, NPC stuff. That's uh, that, that's there for you. And, and down to areas mm-hmm. and specifically one, one boss later that makes the biggest change kind of in the game that changes yeah. one area. So, Completely. you know, so crazily. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it is. Uh, I I also wish there was more signposting. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then the angry vagina thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can I, I can see it like the 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 the, yeah. the flaps. Yeah, there are flaps. The um, yeah. So <laughs> I guess I'm, it does keep with it. The, yeah. I don't know how intentional it was. Like yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we've been accused of being squeamish about the sex stuff in games, or like in uh, in, in this game specifically. I can see it. <laughs> so yeah, I can see. It. Yeah, I'm, I'm way into it. it. I'm not squeamish yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. um, th- and that's not. I, I had to again on on Facebook. I had to kind of like explain myself about that. Um, it's not like sexual themes that make me squeamish. Like mm-hmm. there is a specific because somebody asked me on Facebook and they were like, "How are you? How are you going to deal with this when the story continues and and you know sex kind of comes to the forefront?" Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is like. Sex as a thematic abstract I'm way into in a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I think utilizing uh, sex for horror purposes yeah. is really primal because we all have an anxiety about sex, even if we have a very positive attitude about it, which I like to think that I do. Yeah. Um, growing up, it is the other. Like, yep. it is so weird. And that is very primal. And, like, one of the scariest things I've I've read, one of my the scariest mm-hmm. comic books I've ever read, is uh, Alan Moore's Neonomicon, yep. which is like sex as horror, mm-hmm. you know, and I like it. Like it, it really is effective on me. Yeah. That still feels different to me than somebody being like, you can use this doll, which is like, it's so direct mm-hmm. and not thematic. Yeah. You know, it's like, it, it is, if you, if you just think of sex as in general, like this thing has sex in it, Yeah. then it ties in, but sex is more complicated than mm-hmm. that. And stories are more complicated than that. Yeah. That, that just, you know, clanged on me where it doesn't later when you start getting into the more of the birth yeah. theming just see one of my favorite directors like david cronenberg right like that's a yeah. huge thing for him yeah 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 there's a different like i don't like being titillated mm-hmm. is what it is i don't like being i don't want to be uh that's not what i'm interested in i'm interested yeah. in using sex as kind of a uh you know it's not like i don't like being titillated <laughs> at all yeah well like I, just, I, I, I i've been titillated from time to time <laughs> but like, the, the, uh, it's, it's it's a venue thing right yeah. Yeah, exactly. In my video games, I don't want video games to try to turn me on. Mm-hmm. I do want them to use sex to freak me out. Yeah. Um, and same thing with, with a lot, like most art things too, like same thing mm-hmm. with literature, yeah. you know, like, uh, and I'm always talking about Shadow Over Innsmouth. That involves sex and terror yeah. in a way that directly recalls this game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, it, it is a wonderful parable of uh, a parable about miscegenation. Yes. Yeah. Which, which is something that you, miscegenation is fine. Yep. It is like, it's not like no, never let my endorsement of HP Lovecraft <laughs> be an endorsement yep. of all of his ideas. Yep, on I, I know. I know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the I've <clears throat> like, I've been asked about that before. And like, if there was a way for him to still make money off his stories, I probably mm-hmm. wouldn't support him. Yep. Um, but the fact that like there's, he's long dead. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be like saying, I don't want to read the Bible because it condones slavery. Right. You know, which like, would be I ridiculous. Don't give Jesus money. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, there's lots of reasons not read the Bible. Well, there's lots of reasons to read the Bible too. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm just joking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's the same thing for me. Like mm-hmm. it is like there, Hey, there's, here's a book with a bunch of terrible fucking ideas in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you sift through it for the good yeah. ideas. It, it's, it's one yeah. of those things where like, you can't even be mad that it espouses them because nobody really like believes in that anymore. So you can't even get mad yeah. at the people who would potentially like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like yeah. nobody, nobody, even like the worst, you know, straw man Bible thumper you can imagine doesn't endorse slavery because mm-hmm. it's in the Bible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Luke, Luke says via contact. Uh, in an earlier letter, I mentioned hypothetically being interested in a version of Bloodborne set entirely in Yarnum City, much to your disgust. <laughs> Old Yarnum encapsulates both sides of the argument pretty uh, perfectly, I think. Opening the big ticketed door, despite the protestations of its markings, evokes images of plague and quarantine that escalate with what we've heard about the city's calamity prior. If this is the part that they sealed off during the last hunt, the buildings that they burnt out and built around rather than battled over, then it must have something pretty intense going on in its core. This isn't so much the case, the enemies varying only marginally from those we've faced before. The name, too, Old Yarnum, <laughs> gives opportunity for a change of scenery without ever leaving the city. If this is a part of Yarnum built by an older generation, perhaps the founders, uh, then it would have its own unique architectural style and give us a greater glimpse into the history of this Palimpest city. Mm-hmm. Um, this, too, is an opportunity missed. The lower levels achieve this distinction aesthetically, but there's nothing uh, to do in the small village, the small, small village. The level is fun if you flute it uh, or fluke it like I did my first time, and don't get intimidated by the machine gun, but it's not a departure from Central Yarnum. If the game were simply uh, levels like this, then it would tire quickly. 
but I still think that there is potential uh, potential for more variation within the theme, which could have allowed more time to flesh out the city and the hunt. Two entities that are a lot more incomprehensible to me than the literally formless and unfathomable ones that come later. And love, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that like this area, you know, like we're we're getting out of the uh, out of the stretch of the game that we feel is monotonous, right? We're Look. we're getting there. The, a lot of the cathedral ward feels that way for me still too. Yeah, yeah. and the cathedral ward is very big. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through. I I had that initial thought when we first did it, and I was like, maybe we should split this up into two areas. And then I was like, well, there's just one boss. And I went through and played it, and I think by ground we're going to cover it's going to be the biggest mm-hmm. um but the kind of highlight based approach we take is not going to make it that big of a deal yeah um but it's huge like mm-hmm. it is you spend a lot of time in cathedral ward which does look different than central yarnum but not different enough mm-hmm. um so that is the last gasp of kind of like sameness yeah but even this I was area so happy with... when i got <laughs> good good i'm sorry yeah i just said i was so happy when i got to hemwick <laughs> like I was just like, oh great! Like this isn't that inspired looking, but man, is it different? Uh huh. You know. Yeah. But even this area, like the the the, the changing the the change in color palette was uh, was enough to kind of sate me until I got to that until the you know the the actual departure that the game takes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Mm. It is welcome. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the idea of like this, I, I love, I love that we're going to this area that has been sealed off, right? Like it reminds me of, uh, like half-life going to the, uh, uh, what is it? The, the, the area Ravenholm? that's overrun. Uh, yeah. Ra- Ravenholm, Ravenholm. Definitely that. Or I was thinking like more about half-life one, the, uh, the missile silos with the, uh, with oh, the, sure. yeah, with, with the blind, uh, beasts that, uh, kind of follow your sound. Um, the fact that that is kind of boarded up from the outside and you are very intentionally trying to go into this place that other people do not want you to go. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really, really evocative and great. Yeah, Agreed yeah. there. And there's also something about like, oh, old Yarnum. Like, what is the area of town that like a lot of people don't want to go to? Oh, it's downtown, the, the area that's been there, uh, the, like the longest, right? Um, yeah. At least, okay. So I'm projecting a lot of Cincinnati stuff here, but uh, the, 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 the media down here doesn't want uh, people to go, to go downtown because there's a bunch of like dangerous people who are going to kill you. Again, race, race, yeah. race. Um, but um, but yeah, like the like there's there's a little bit of that here as well. I think typically, like in towns, yeah. the oldest part of town usually tends to be a little bit more run down mm-hmm. and and lower income. That's yep. not always the case, but often it's case. It's case here as well. Yeah. Um, like there's old town, which is it's not the most kind of run down area in Portland, but it's you know it's fairly close. Yeah. Um, it's it's the part of downtown that almost looks like a dangerous city. Yep. Um, until you realize like no part of Portland is dangerous. Right. And those thoughts are just racist and terrible. Yep. Um, yeah. Same. Same here. It's a. It is a very big issue in Cincinnati. But yeah, it's a bummer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Mandy writes in via contact saying, "I feel that the Bloodstar Beast is a true test of the skills the game teaches the player through the two bosses in the area before it. Cleric Beast teaches you proper positioning against large enemies, and Papa G showed that the game demanded reaction time and speed that No Souls game had ever had before." BSB shows that an enemy can be huge and just as fast as Papa G. Um, I feel that, uh, that it's one of the better bosses in the game since it succeeds so well in punishing old souls habits of keeping distance and analyzing movement. You're rewarded for playing very aggressively against him since his moveset gives no room for defensive play and the position forces you uh, to race against uh, time since antidotes are limited. Great boss and hope you guys died a lot to it too. I definitely did. I would uh, be curious that Mandy, like the, the, or, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say what, I didn't. Gonna I, I was, I was gonna like oh. beat my chest a little bit and say no, it was no problem. But go oh. ahead. Well, good. <laughs> um, congratulations. The, uh, I w- I'm curious as to way how you feel like square that aggression though with the fact that you constantly have to be using antidotes yep. with them because those those things it does like it really does feel like uh, too contrasty for me to be like a really great boss. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily agree with you um, about it. Not that, you know, like it, that doesn't matter. It's a video mm-hmm. game. We can disagree about a boss yeah. and everybody has their their weaknesses. But to me, like though that aggression didn't work well with the status effect. And and then also the issues uh, brought up by the, the listener earlier who talked about the camera um, and it being hard to avoid his grab attack because mm-hmm. you have to. It's really hard to fight him locked on. Yeah. So, you know, I had that experience instead and died a lot. But Cole did. Cole mastered it. <laughs> um cool 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 more or less aced it and uh i can't wait until we can talk about the bosses that i aced <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh it's, it's it's like a conference it's a conservation of frustration a little bit yeah 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 
Um, and finally, just fun in. Um, Trent says, "Are you contact. okay? Are you doing hey, all right?" I, I I'm not. I, I have a bunch of dental work that I have to have done. Oh no, it's I'm a really sorry. bummer. I, I can't really afford it. Um, yeah, I have to have a, I have to have my wisdom teeth taken out because one of them has been bothering me for like two days now. Oh no, and I, I can't really afford it. The um, so I mean I, I'm gonna figure it out. Like yeah. life finds a way. But the uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of bummed out. Hmm. But that wasn't the this fun and we're talking about here. <laughs> this is this is this is a different kind of just fun and. Huh. Um, Trent says by uh, just fun and. Uh, hey guys, as a longtime Lovecraft fan, a few people have asked me what Lovecraft stories they should read in the context of getting a better appreciation for the references in Bloodborne. My immediate, re- my immediate response is always the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, uh, because it really shines some light on the dream side of Bloodborne. Other than that, I think The Whisper in the Darkness and The Dunwich Horror are pretty essential, but I try to keep the list short. What are you guys' thoughts? Does Bloodborne take a lot from any specific Lovecraft story? Lovecraft story? And this is um, where I bow to you, Gary, because you have more knowledge of this than I do. Yeah, the um, and it's interesting that you bring this up because we we don't know where it's at, but we're going to do a Lovecraft episode mm-hmm. um, in this in this season uh, because we're thinking the same thing um, that that uh, your your friends are. So mm-hmm. look forward to that at some point as a special episode, probably once the the series Lovecraft stuff gets introduced into the mm-hmm. storyline. Yeah, we'll do a break and and talk about some some stories. Um, I the one those are good. The only thing I would add in there is From Beyond, which mm-hmm. is always my go to Lovecraft recommendation because it's very short. It's very easy to get into, and the changes with insight that happen, the big ones that we're not talking about, um, but the walking around the cathedral ward with forty insight, <laughs> that's so From Beyond as to be like that. You could draw a direct line yeah. um, from that to the the premise of From Beyond. Um, and then also, I think I always like to recommend Shadow Over Innsmouth. Yep, um, which is also a civilization making contact with something beyond its ken mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, breeding going on and yeah. adding trouble, even though that is more about miscegenation, as we mentioned. Yep. Um, it is, it is it's, it's ballsy of you, I think, to recommend the dream quest of unknown Kadath because I think that story is really dry. Like, it does introduce this idea of the dream world, but, like, that story goes in really weird directions and tons of tangents. Like there's a whole part where he talks to this army of cats <laughs> and they're there. It's not just an army of cats. Like here are a lot of cats. Like I live in a house with four cats. You could say it's an army of cats. <laughs> it is a regimented army of cats that can talk to each other and have ranks like general and sergeant <laughs> and are preparing for war. Like, are you describing a, a T.S. Eliot poem, Gary? It, it is, it is, it is bonkers. Like it is a really, really weird story. Huh. Um, but it does like the dreamlands as a concept is very, uh, very germane mm-hmm. to uh, that. So I almost think that, like, you could do worse than, if you don't want to actually read the stories, if you can't get through the purple prose or don't want to support a, you know, a long dead, you know, <laughs> terrible person, um, just reading, like, a wiki mm-hmm. on the, on these things, like the Lovecraft wiki where you get to read about the dreamlands and stuff, or even, like, this is this is far be for me to suggest this kind of thing, but you can get a lot of that if you read, like, TV tropes. Mm-hmm. Like, the TV tropes entry for Lovecraft, like, yeah. actually does a pretty good job of just, here are the concepts. Yeah. Um, or listen you know. to the uh, to the HP Podcraft. Like, that's a that's a pretty oh, good way yeah. to get summaries of that stuff in a very lightweight way, especially if you are already used to listening to podcasts. Yeah, th- thanks for me even, you know, or thanks for, for showing that up, because I, I try to recommend that whenever I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that podcast. And that is that is definitely my favorite. Like, I think that's the way to definitely experience Dream Quest, mm-hmm. um, because those guys are funny about it, uh, you know, Jad and Chris. Um, and uh, they also, you know, you don't have to read a whole novella mm-hmm. that is very, very purple. Like, the psychedelic Lovecraft stuff is not my favorite. Yep. Like, I like the ideas, but it's not my favorite thing to read. Mm-hmm. And uh, those guys do a great job. Yeah. So... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think that's just that's about it. Yeah, I think so. Thank you everybody um, for listening. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we real quick. We don't have deleted scenes this episode. <laughs> I was listening. I keep uh, trying to make when we have guests. Um, you know, we usually want to get on right away, mm-hmm. and so we don't uh, spend too much time. And then their time is valuable, so we don't spend that much time goofing around. So I've been trying to couch it by saying like some very brief deleted scenes, mm-hmm. and then I have to like search for one little tiny goof to put in there. <laughs> But this time I did it ahead of time and noticed that there's there are no goofs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got down to business, so this is the end of the uh, the episode. Yeah. Um, what can people do to help us out, Cole? Well, they can go to uh, patreoncom slash TV. There, they, if you if you like us, you can kick, uh, kick us a couple of bucks a month. That doesn't just support this show, but a bunch of other shows on the network, which you can all listen to. Yeah, and we we recommend it. And uh, head on over to uh, duckfeed.tv for a bunch of other shows and a bunch of other blogs mm-hmm. and stores and cool things to do. And uh, we will be back. Uh, and if you have uh, things to say about uh, the, the Cathedral Ward, um, we'll be back next week 
with Dave Klein to talk about that. So we want your questions. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. Yep. And usually we don't have to sign up for the appendix because we usually <laughs> have deleted scenes. So uh, I guess what uh, what should they do until next time, Cole? <sighs> um, seek the good blood. Yeah, I was just inviting you. Yeah, see, I was inviting you to use the same one as last time if you want. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, I suppose uh, the, 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 the night ends sometime, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sometime, I guess. Umbaza. Yeah, Umbaza. <laughs> And we all pray that we will have far more soon. Well, th- thanks again for uh, for joining us. Yeah, we really appreciate pleasure. it. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. It's always nice to be given the opportunity to talk about um, Bloodborne <laughs> or Dark Souls or whatever. <laughs> Saves me just endlessly talking about them on my own podcasts <laughs> to people wait, wait. who don't want to listen to it. <laughs> that, that's why we started this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, can direct, you can direct people uh, direct people to this appearance <laughs> as kind of a uh, runoff or pressure relief. I just need the Monster Hunter one now. Just <laughs> <laughs> like, get, get it marginalized. <laughs> I'm su- I'm surprised that 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 more of those haven't popped up actually. Well, like specific ones. Yeah, yeah, like a like like a like a per game treatment or like a like a deep dive into Monster Hunter itself. Like I, I don't I I don't see any of, any of those like on the charts. And with as much as those games kind of have an established following now, I would that, like that would make sense to me. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It is it is it's interesting. I think it's just the way that like uh, games are kind of covered is just changing dramatically at the moment you know yeah. um and i think actually podcasts are weirdly like after many years of people going oh there's no point doing podcasts like no one listens to podcasts podcasts are now really in mm-hmm. again ever since serial <laughs> yeah yeah I, we're, we're before then, but, i know I'm, yeah. just, I'm just being funny no, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i think specialized stuff is the way forward mm-hmm yeah, yeah, we we find that often if we look at look at the charts. And formerly, you know, Minecraft was kind of the champion, but now you see every once in a while like Destiny specific mm-hmm. uh, podcast and and the like as well. So it's it's only a matter of time before yeah. every game series <laughs> gets mm-hmm. its own. It's, it's funny. I'd be tempted to do something similar myself, but it's that thing of being like because I've, I've kind of made my bed with what I do. It's that weird thing. If I then decide, actually, I'm just going to go all out and do this. Mm-hmm. I think you should really piss off loads of people. <laughs> like, what? You're not going to do we, anything else? You're just going to yeah. talk about destiny? Really? <laughs> we, you do. You do so much. Like, I don't know where you'd find time to do. Yeah. Like it, it would definitely be a, uh, a choice. Oh, no, you that's know, what I mean. So, it would be yeah. like, I'm not doing anything else now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it, especially if you started a Destiny. I would be disappointed if you started a Destiny only podcast as somebody who's never played Destiny. They'd no, be like, well, shit, of no more videos. Yeah, one of the things, do you know about, um, Matt, do you know about the weird memory leak bug? Yeah. That was going on? The, yeah. Uh, so I, that, that first time I fought that boss, I was, I was under the memory leak bug. And she was uh, super easy and didn't do anything. And then I went back on my second playthrough and I had a really hard time with her. Which boss? Uh, mm, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, uh, that's, that, that's how I beat her as well. Yeah. Just like her, she, all she did was just headbutt like an idiot, which I kind of liked from a lore perspective. Like, uh-huh. I was kind of like, oh, this is a really cool intersection of gameplay and characterization. Yeah. Um, it turned out not to be true. Yeah. No, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried because this is, you know, I'm doing my second playthrough for the show. And I think that the, the, the tail off in boss fight difficulty like from let's say uh amygdala on um is pretty much i i I worry that that was all that was all memory leak stuff yeah it definitely could be so it'll be interesting to see how that works out yeah um yeah let me uh i'll get us back in (laughs) 